Friends, welcome to this Martin Luther King Jr. National Holiday, gathering on this second Sunday of Epiphany. We had well over a hundred folks uh, register for this from all over the United States and Canada, as well as the UK, Norway, Brazil, Germany, Wales, and Australia. So we are so very grateful to all of you uh, for joining us. Two days ago, Dr. King would have turned 92 years old. <laughs> and 11 days ago, on the Feast of Epiphany, new layers of toxic white supremacy and Christian nationalism were revealed at our nation's capital. And today, Officials are on high alert for more anti-democracy violence. Such events challenge us to go deeper into our discipleship of decolonization, racial justice, and democratic equity. This gathering is the second of our two pre-institute stepping stone programs to prepare for our upcoming Bartimaeus Kinsler Institute 2021. And that online gathering will be taking place next month, February 12th to the 15th. Tonight, a panel of thoughtful and deeply committed activists of color will talk about how they relate to indigenous solidarity work and how they understand the occupation Pay, excuse me, how they understand the connection between historic patterns of U.S. settler colonialism and the contemporary experience of occupied Palestine. We will also have music and greetings from esteemed friends and colleagues. We want to say a special thank you to Tim Knopfseeker, who is beaming, out, beaming in just down the block, and Chris White, who is in the next room, for helping prepare and produce this Zoom program. Our team is broadcasting from the Ventura River watershed in Southern California on traditional unceded Chumash territory. So it's the new year, albeit one that has already revealed very old contradictions in American society. The music video that you are about to see is a kind of New Year's wake up call. So, re Jubilee year tradition into the current struggle for racial and economic justice. It celebrates the true insurrection that grew and grew last year, namely the Black Lives Matter movement. Last October, we were introduced to the work of Reverend Darren Haygood. He's the lead pastor at Long Beach Church of Christ, holds an MDiv from Abilene Christian University, and was part of Pepperdine's most recent Communitas cohort. Reverend Haygood also performs as Theo Blue, producing hip hop anthems such as The Same, which debuted last year on the King holiday, and Throw Salt, made for the George Lloyd and Breonna Taylor protests. We're really delighted to have Darren with us tonight, but before we meet him, we invite you to watch and listen carefully to Theo's most recent piece entitled, This That Year. Let it serve as our invocation for tonight's sacred work. I declare today, not tomorrow or yesterday, Today, the new year. All of my weight gone, all the self hate gone, all of my foes gone, all of my friends gone, all of my friends they wonder why we don't. I'ma get ratchet. And this a year I'ma pop off like a pop star when they finally hit a fella make another hit. This a year I'ma run up on the stage full of Kanye, hit the highest man on the Taylor Swift. This a year I'ma run up in the stands swinging on a fan, bringing world peace down with my fears. This a year I'ma say what I wanna say when I wanna say, cuz it's the end. Yeah, this that year I'ma just talk my slang, tell these white boys catch up. This that year all of my dreads gon' hang, putting this game on lock. This that year we gon' lay down the Glocks, calling out all of these hawks. This that year government watch your back, I'm stepping down all of these lies. This that year. 
here, I'ma talk climate change. If we don't, we gon' die. This, that gear, we might die anyway. But they can't say we ain't try. This, that gear, I'ma invest in us. Treat the family like stock. This, that gear, I'ma be ratchet, cuz I'ma be walking and talking like this, that gear. All of my weight gon' drop. All the self ain't gon' stop. This, that gear. All of my phones gon' flop. All of my friends gon' pop. This, that gear. All of my friends is fake. Wonder why we don't talk. But I'm still walking with God This that year I'ma play Kirk Franklin Putting GP on stomp This that year I'ma tell Donald Trump You about to get all of us jump This that year I'ma tell Joe Biden If he don't forget student day What's that say? Trump Big Trump 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 Trump
I, I mean, I think it started with with COVID, uh, just in the conversations and just the, the feel around COVID felt like everyone was just waiting for the year to be over, as if like 2021 would mm. magically manifest a uh, difference. Um, yeah. I think we're all still waiting on it. <laughs> Um, but so I, I didn't set out to just you know, make a Jubilee song in particular, but upon reflection and after creating the song, I realized, you know, that that was a part of the dynamic. Um, I don't think I had the, the words for the feeling that I was feeling originally, uh, but now I would say, um, I think I was trying to capture this truth that I've been sitting with that, um, that God wants me to exist. Um, and to exist to the full in me as a black person in my community as a black community not as another community but as us um, and I think police brutality racial injustice and more have that nasty and disturbing kind of way of creeping into the soul and saying the opposite um, that God doesn't want me here and that, that debt hatred uh, emotional or physical chains are all echoing the fundamental truth um, or uh, fundamental lie, should I say, that God doesn't want me here. Um, mm -hmm. And for me, Jubilee or this, that year is trying to lay hold of the words of Jesus. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me um, to set people free. And I'm simply trying to proclaim that the truth, um, the truth that God wants us here. He wants all of us here. Yeah. And Jubilee's on the way, freedom is on the way, uh, because the spirit is on the side of our existence. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. it, that's, that's what I was trying to, to formulate. Yeah. yeah. You know, we, uh, we often re remind white folk that if not for the black community in America, um, we really probably wouldn't know anything about the Jubilee tradition because it really was African slaves in American fields and then early gospel music that kept alive the tradition that that white slaveholders were trying to suppress and uh, and we've we've studied a lot of that old music about Jubilee and uh, and I think we just found uh, our new favorite anthem uh, <laughs> that that articulates that and so thanks for carrying on that tradition. Um, where uh, where do you see in, in your work, your sphere uh, down there in Southern California, where do you see folks rising to this vision um, that, that excites you in specific ways? Um, so the two ways that I think I've seen is, um, one, in the church that I'm a part of, um, some of the congregants just took a deep dive into American history, uh, or America's history with racial injustice in particular. Mm -hmm. Um, and the American church's complicity in it. Um, and that was long and hard and painful for uh, many in the congregation, uh, just coming to terms with that. Um, but I think on the other end, because that was all, we, a lot of what we did last year, I'm just seeing a lot of hope and uh, excitement about contributing to justice and wholeness. Um, the second is, I'm a part of a group, uh, it's called TECA, the Equity Collective Alliance that also started last year. Still in the baby stages, um, but we're intersectional and environmentalists. So we've been looking at ways that racial injustice overlap with environmental justice. Um, and we think our work starts by getting people to see that we are all in this collective bondage. Um, so going back to the, the Jubilee a theme like how, how do we all get free um how do we all work towards a freedom together and seeing others um come a part of whether it's in church um or part of this, this small group that i'm i'm in teka um, i've seen people thirsty for that freedom and understanding that our freedom is bound up in the freedom of others uh, so we just have been seeing that not only in the, the racial justice sector, but also in terms of the environment as it relates to tech at least. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, uh, we just really appreciate you being uh, with us here tonight and hope you'll come back, be part of our Institute next month. And um, <clears throat> we, we, we appreciate your, uh, 
getting to know you and getting to know your yeah. work. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, and I want to add my thanks, Darren. So good to meet you. So good to have you uh, be a part of our program and now a part of our uh, friendship circle. And thank you for bringing your powerful prophetic voice um, for us to all hear this afternoon. And we really do look forward to collaborating with you more uh, in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Another treasured voice in our community comes from the other side of the generational spectrum. Reverend Art Cribbs uh, grew up in Compton and has pastored several UCC churches in Southern California, but he has just moved very far away from us out to Virginia to serve as interim pastor of the historic Hope Church in Alexandria. So this is very sad for us, but very good news for our friends in the Metro DC area. And if you are there, Listen up, Carter. yes, make sure you go meet Art and uh, check out his church. We have a long friendship with Art and because he is also a radio and television journalist, we knew that his was the perfect voice to intone Dr. King's words with which we frame tonight's theme and through which we honor our greatest American prophet. Now hear the words of a prophet who came before us, lived among us, and continues to recognize the significance of the unfinished business in this nation. Hear these words. For too long, the depth of racism in American life has been underestimated. The surgery necessary to extract it is necessarily complex and detailed. As a beginning, it is necessary to x-ray our history and reveal the full extent of the disease. Our nation was born in genocide when it embraced the doctrine that the original American, the Indian, was an inferior race. Even before there were large numbers of black folk on our shore, the scar of racial hatred had already disfigured colonial society. From the 16th century forward, blood flowed in battles over racial superiority. We are perhaps the only nation which tried as a matter of national policy to wipe out its indigenous population. Moreover, we elevate that tragic experience into a noble crusade. Indeed, even today, we have not permitted ourselves to reject or feel remorse for this shameful episode. Our literature, our films, our drama, our folklore, all exalted. It is this tangled web of prejudice from which many Americans now seek to liberate themselves without realizing how deeply it has been woven into their consciousness. The prophet, Martin Luther King Jr., from his book, Why We Can't Wait, published in 1963. months B.I. But I now want to introduce two more longtime BCM friends and colleagues, known and loved by many folks on this call, Sarah and Jonathan Nahar. Sarah is a graduate of Spelman College and Anabaptist Mennonite Biblical Seminary and recipient of a Fulbright Scholarship in Argentina. She served as director of Christian Peacemaker Teams and now is pursuing doctoral work in New York, studying scatology and ecology, sometimes known as holy shit. Her partner, Jonathan, graduated from the Kroc Institute. Thanks. Thanks, Chad left. You know, graduated from the Kroc, Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies at Notre Dame. He worked as a human rights advocate in Hebron, Palestine with Christian peacemaker teams and as Mennonite Church USA coordinator 
of the Israel-Palestine Partners in Peacemaking. He is currently Communications Director for Friends of Sabeel North, North America. Recently wed, Sarah and Jonathan participated in the Rotary Peace Fellowship in Thailand. They sent these brilliant intersectional reflections all the way from Kenya, where they are visiting Sarah's cousin. Greetings. Hi, BKI community. I'm Sarah Nahar. And I'm Jonathan Nahar. And uh, we're from the middle of the Great Lakes watershed and Elk Ray, Indiana. St. Mary's, Ohio. And that's traditional Potawatomi land. And, and Shawnee land. Yeah, that's right. And right now, though, we're recording this from Kenya. And that is the land of many peoples. And really blessed to be able to send some greetings from here for the gathering. And hope you all are doing well wherever you are today. So, yeah. We're, we're both descended of willing and unwilling settlers in many ways on the lands in which we live. Um, for me, that's generations of fugitive Mennonites as well as formerly enslaved African. Uh, I also have Mennonite ancestry as well as Palestinian ancestry. And we heard that the first question is, what do we do for MLK Day? And for me, like the holidays aren't really over until MLK Day weekend like finishes. And I usually, I guess we usually work on things wherever we are. Um, connecting with the communities, but also I've been serving the family of Martin Luther King Jr. through the work at the MLK Center for Nonviolent Social Change in Atlanta since I was in college there and, and helping out Mrs. King as well as um, in 2018 there was a 50 year since 1968 uh, gathering and both Jonathan and I were able to assist in helping to do generational bridge building at that time. And this year, there's a Global Beloved Community Summit, and I'll be facilitating a few panels around truth-telling in service of the urgency of creating the beloved community. Mm -hmm. So that's some of the things yeah. to do. And this is the uh, second of three MLK days that we've had together where we are out of the country and sharing stories about Martin Luther King Jr. with an international audience uh, has been part of what we've uh, used that holiday for. Uh, in these various communities. Two years ago, we were in Thailand uh, and hosted uh, people from a variety of countries on MLK Day to share, uh, and we look forward to doing something similar this year. Uh, how do you, as a settler of color, connect with uh, indigenous activists and mm. indigenous struggles in the U.S.? Yeah, well, for me, and I'll just I'll talk directly mm. here. For me, part of it is where I start the narrative. Like, I used to start like black folks story in relation to the nation state of the US with enslavement, but growing awareness like now invites me to start it earlier and not with a nation state per se. Now I talk a lot more about the doctrine of discovery and how that's growing out of Western Christian supremacy thinking. And I really wanna note that the first violence perpetuated against black people due to the doctrine of discovery and the colonization wasn't enslavement. Rather, it was the invasion of our indigenous communities and lands as part of the continent of Africa, the genocidal destruction of our communities, and the extraction of natural resources from their indigenous relational context through a lot of things, but especially through the kidnapping of millions and millions of people. And starting the story earlier is a reminder that we are not just the economic entity of slave, but actually we are indigenous peoples and ripped from our belonging is part of the heartache that, that I carry and that we carry and also a place where I can connect with indigenous uh -huh. folks across Turtle Island who, although perhaps in closer proximity to historical spaces and ways, not able to be in a relationship with those in the mm -hmm. same way. So. Um, the elimination of indigeneity for those of us who were trafficked um, and for the most part our inability to have a chance to recover that uh, is an open wound and across the Atlantic, um, across the continent of Africa, the imposition of foreign rule and the creation of class structures that reproduce unequal social relationships have 
also made it difficult to remain connected to rooted practices and life ways and to participate coherently in the broader world. However, of course, just like across Turtle Island and Abiyajala, like so many efforts across the African continent continue for self-determination and for rerouting and connection. So learning from the space of Kenya that we're in right now and the ways that others are thinking um, has, has been really meaningful and, and nourishing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so what about you, Jonathan? Um, or did you want to respond to that? How, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. How do you stay connected as someone with ancestries from multiple lineages mm. with indigenous struggles in the U.S. and Canada? Yeah, yeah. so uh, my mixed lineage is of uh, a white Mennonite side and a Palestinian side. And um, in that mixture, in, in the work that I do, it's as uh, a Palestinian challenging the ways that colonial Christianity has affected Palestine, particularly uh, the ways that uh, Christian Zionism and theologies of uh, extraction and exploitation and chosenness of one above another, um, the, that hierarchy of belonging and hierarchy of uh, love or humanity, um, how destructive that has been and continues to be. And that's something that I think connects the Palestinian struggle with indigenous struggles in the U.S. as well. Uh, so recognizing the way that the doctrine of discovery put white Europeans above uh, native peoples, above black people, uh, in the same way that Christian Zionism puts Europeans above Palestinians um, and continues those uh, exploited uh, forms of theology, those racist forms of theology, really. Um, and so with, with my work uh, with Friends of Sabeel North America, uh, which supports Palestinian liberation theology uh, and that movement both in Palestine and in the U.S., uh, recognizing, uh, like, can Christianity be something besides the religion of empire, besides a colonial religion? Like, what might that look like? And of course, as a Palestinian, I say, what does Christianity look like as an indigenous tradition? What does Christianity look like when it's practiced in the place mm -hmm. where it was founded? Um, and there's something, so a lot of times, like, we look back to the early church uh, and what they did, but what was the culture that surrounded that as well? Um, and something that amazes me uh, as also a Mennonite and a, someone who sees pacifism as, as a central part of living out the Christian faith, uh, in the early 2000s, Palestinian Christians from all the different denominations uh, that have now been created that are there came together uh, to give a word to the church around the world. Um, this was called the Kairos document. And they said, we must resist the injustice that's happening to us. But they also said, we will resist nonviolently. Uh, and the fact that uh, that was, I heard one person say, this is, might be the first time in Christian history that all the Christians of a place rejected violence. I said, actually, it's rejected violence. It was Palestine in the first century and Palestine in the 21st century. So there's something particularly unique about the way that the culture in Palestine connects to Christianity uh, consistently across the years. Um, so how can we recognize Christianity both as an indigenous tradition to Palestine and as something that uh, a lot of people who aren't Palestinians now practice and as something that has become uh, part of the global colonial mindset as well. So picking up on that and thinking about the ways in which in Palestine the Christian movement continues to really gather around um, the, you know, the renewal that, that Jesus was, was pointing towards and, and the revelation he embodied and the revolution of values. I'm thinking a lot of uh, kind of the swing back on that movement context, back to mm -hmm. Turtle Island, Abiyajala, um, thinking about the interactions between um, various um, peoples and indigenous folks, 
that wasn't necessarily within a settlement framework. So like there's been a long, you know, there's always been like, like population of Afro native people and significant interaction of continental Africans, indigenous peoples. But like more recently, like some activism for positive social change within our communities has has often been separate and that's partially because of how white supremacy impacts our communities differently as kelly hayes writes um, white supremacy speaks to erase indigenous mm -hmm. peoples and exploits black folks it wants to see indigenous peoples disappear it's called seeing christians disappear but it wants black folks to stay around and accept our subordinate status and there's also historical tensions that come up due to the divide and conquer tactics of u.s power brokers for example abraham lincoln is a figure of tension black folks to some extent see his work as helping to reform u.s government policies around enslavement and, and war but that was done on the back of mankato 38 plus two and indigenous folks the largest mass lynching in u.s history was allowed by him and mark charles writes more about that and so um, even though more recently things have been divided, there's always been people who've worked together really significantly, and this is a powerful moment of coming together. So we're seeing how the direct violence against George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and so many other U.S. American black people has resulted in lots of revolt and toppling mm -hmm. statues, including the statues of Columbus, is part of this. And people are recognizing that the narrative power of police brutality mm. comes from the doctrine of discovery, which Columbus epitomizes. So you have the 1455 papal bull that is allowing for permitting the invasion, the extraction and enslavement of folks in West Africa by Spain, Portugal, and others. And that's continuing on across the Atlantic, and and the the, the narrative motor for Columbus's mm. voyages and others. And you know. In our Black-led and Native-led work now in Syracuse, New York, we are working together to topple the Columbus statue. And Syracuse, New York is in unceded Onondaga land, Onondaga being the capital and central fire of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. That's the original Confederacy, not the southern one. Has encompassed a lot of people and a lot of land space over time, but it's currently Seneca, Cayuga, Onondaga, Oneida, and Mohawk. And we've been working together in people of color led coalition to say that indigenous sovereignty and black liberation are linked. Mm -hmm. And we note this because we are working to remove the Columbus statue because Columbus was the first cop. He was an agent of the state with lethal force to command obedience. And that's what the police are. And symbols have power. And a huge statue of him with a westward gaze standing between the cathedral and the courthouse, standing atop derogatory images of Haudenosaunee mm -hmm. peoples. Mm -hmm. And it reminds us daily of the historical violence that is directly connected to the ongoing symbolic and physical violence today that is happening. And so we worked a lot together to say that black liberation and indigenous sovereignty are linked. And Although achieving civil and political rights and decolonization work is not an identical thing all the time, there, there's generative tensions between that work and we work with a lot of white dominated settler ally groups to make sure that the work of non-white and non-native folks isn't erased and to welcome in the generative tensions between political and civil rights work and decolonial work. and. Whiteness has its roots in European Christian hegemony. And so the work that we're doing in terms of addressing white supremacy is also a call for dismantling the doctrine of discovery, dismantling um, white supremacy because um, white folks understood themselves, or European folks understood themselves as Christians before they understood themselves as white, as, as Paul Kibble writes about. And so, and so there is richness and, and perspective that can assist in white dominated settler ally spaces and so if people of color or arrivants settlers of color immigrants unwilling settlers whatever we might choose to call ourselves there's not one word if we're not feeling welcome in this space it's worth asking why and i think it's worth incorporating anti-racism mm -hmm. principles and behaviors as part of indigenous solidarity so mm -hmm. um that's been some meaningful part of the work yeah yeah uh going off a little bit your kind of your 
point about the different terms that are used to describe uh, that it's not just a binary uh, of settler and indigenous, but there's kind of different ways that, that people uh, connect with that. And also just to recognize, like, for myself, like, I am a settler here in North America, like, um, the historical fact that my the wealth of my family is because we own stolen land um, is really important. And also on the other side, like, my parents' family's land has been stolen by the state of Israel as well. So recognizing both um, having been affected by colonization uh, as uh, being uprooted by colonization and uh, being um, like a beneficiary mm -hmm. of colonization um, and being mixed in that in that way as well. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I remember uh, like I think the Palestinian context can can helps me think through how how I interact as a, as a settler as well. Uh, I remember the Israeli journalist Amir Haas asking, like, can a settler ever become native? What might that mean? Uh, and she's someone who uh, has moved to the West Bank to be neighbors with Palestinians as well, but always recognizing the ways that she's part of a colonial system regardless, right? Um, and I know when talking with, like, uh, an excuse that apologists for the state of Israel will give is, well, they were fleeing persecution. There was nowhere else to go. Uh, and similarly, like, my Mennonite family will say the same thing. We were fleeing uh, religious persecution in Europe. We had nowhere else to go, and we found a, we found a home camp, right? and, we, and we took it. And so some, somehow trying to relieve some of the guilt that way. Um, and so it's been really helpful for me to say, like, a settler is created in their interaction with the indigenous population, mm. right? If you come in as a neighbor, uh, if you come in with respect for the people that are already there and their ways and traditions, mm -hmm. and you listen to how they want you to act in their space, mm -hmm. right, with that land recognition, that recognition that it's theirs, and therefore you will uh, understand it in their way. Um, that is one thing. If you come in with an attitude of dominance and exploitation and that hierarchy that you are better than the people that are there, that you will uh, push your ways of being onto this new place, then you are a settler. And to the, to the level that I uh, interact in that way, right, that I participate in that, I am a settler. In the ways in which I resist that, I am an ally. Like, just try, like, being in that tension. Mm -hmm. um, but that's bringing in kind of that Palestinian understanding of being a set of settlers uh, to the, the ways that being a settler here happens as well. And all of that is happening within a structural that's right. context Absolutely. and a legal yeah. context, which is allowing for certain people to have access to land here mm -hmm. or that is driving criminalization here and so for the you know Northeast farmers of color that we've had a chance mm -hmm. to organize with, it's a black and brown food sovereignty collective just working to free the land and free our people mm -hmm. and to, to not be controlled by systems of violence and scarcity and inaccessibility. And you know many of us having come here through global economic push and pull factors, um, they are asking together knowing that we won't be free until we can feed ourselves asking mm. what does it mean for us to be to have food sovereignty on stolen land mm. right? like mm -hmm. what do our accountabilities to traditional stewards of the elements here look like mm. so those efforts are, are underway um, near where we live and upstate new york and in other areas and I, I see you working with language here so maybe just to 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 round it out mm. from from my perspective around language just a, a, one word on that to bring back to my opening point, saying like enslaved Africans rather mm -hmm. than slaves when referring to black folks in historic capacity or that ongoing trauma, um, that, that can help make the point that we as people of African ancestry mm -hmm. were and are so much more than our economic mm -hmm. positions relative to empire. Um, saying enslaved Africans and like 
when I say it, it reminds me of my indigeneity um, and, and the connection to the land of various parts of the African continent, even though I don't know exactly where. Um, and I think on the flip side of that too, I, th I think there's an invitation that I would have to be really careful if you're white to say when you say we are settlers or we mess it all up when we arrived or we humans mm. ha are bad for the planet or, or whatever like when you're actually talking about or referring to a specific group of people or a particular set of power structures so getting much more clear mm. in, in our language mm -hmm. um, does is a way of making space for what may yet emerge in terms of the depth of linked liberation that we all have on the planet now. So, yeah. See y'all in the struggle. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks. So we are very grateful to Sarah and Jonathan for connecting so many dots. Uh, in a moment, you'll hear from two other fr friends and colleagues continue to connect these dots. But we're midway through <clears throat> tonight's program and let's just pause. You might want to close your eyes. Let's everybody take a, a big breath. Connect with our bodies, with our feet on the ground. as our spirits attempt to metabolize these good words. And as always in our work, we want to have a brief gospel interlude. Uh, this text comes from the common. You'll recognize it from John's account of Jesus' encounter with Nathaniel. <clears throat> I see you, says the rabbi to this prospective but disciple. Jesus then famously invites Nathaniel to see how the human one embodies the venerable tradition of Jacob's dream, which is so poignantly, in my opinion, captured here by the great French Jewish artist Marc Chagall, who was himself a refugee from Nazism. The evangelist John is alluding to that ancient wilderness story from Genesis 28, in which a revered Palestinian ancestor falls asleep with his head on a dreaming stone. Yes, this is the inspiration for the name of Tevin and Jay's project in North Carolina. Jacob has what anthropologists of religion call an axis mundi moment, a vision of the mystical connection between earth and heaven. This image serves as a reminder that creator is constantly infusing our weary world with redemptive and healing energy from above. It is this energy that Jesus, the human one, uniquely inhabits and which he here invites Nathaniel and all of us to have eyes to see. So as we summon the courage to embrace the way, we surely need this sort of clarity and connection to do the hard work of decolonization. Amen. For the second part of tonight's program, we are delighted to have with us live two more friends. Both of these women employ food justice platforms to promote new paradigms of political and personal transformation. Linda Kikivish is a geographer, popular educator and translator who works locally with one of our partners, the Abundant Table Farm Project. With a doctorate in geography from the University of North Carolina and a postdoc at Brown University, 
Kiki's scholarship comparatively examines movements in Mexico, Palestine, and the US. And she is currently working on a book entitled Palestine and the Wretched of Empire, Race, Cartography, and the Afterlives of 19, excuse me, 1492. And Vivian Sansur divides her time between Palestine and the US. And we are fortunate enough to catch her during a visit here to Southern California, where we've had the pleasure of getting to know her this week. Trained in the field of anthropology, she is founder of the Palestine Heirloom Seed Library. Vivian has worked with farmers globally on issues relating to agriculture and independence and is working on bringing threatened food varieties back to the dinner table so we can eat our history as part of our living culture. Vivian is also an artist, food columnist, and Harvard Fellow in Religion, Conflict, and Peace. So these two women, older friend and a newer friend, are good friends, and we welcome you both to this circle. So Kiki, we'll turn it over to you. Sure, thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for inviting me and for allowing me to also be a part of uh, listening. Um, I'm reflecting quite a bit and I think that um, there's so much, there's always so much to learn from other people's offerings and I want to begin my offering by um, just stating a caveat uh, that I follow Maya spirituality, the spirituality of my ancestors and one of my spiritual guides is of the knife, uh, which, is, um, which is a spirit guide that is very committed to truth. Um, and I've been told I use it as a sword very well, but sometimes I can be very blunt and I need to be careful and just cut out the cancer and not kill the patient when I provide analyses. So it's something that I'm still trying to um, practice. So um, please forgive me if I, in my, in, my, in my journey to cut out the cancer, I might also injure another part, but it's, it's not my intention. Um, the question that we were asked, um, how do we relate to the King holiday and uh, the Southern Freedom Black Lives Matter movement and how do I interact with indigenous justice issues? Black and indigenous land struggles are what I think about almost every single moment of my life in the work that I do. And mostly I think about how is it that we can heal these movements that often don't talk to each other and sadly are often in uh, a lot of uh, very painful arguments. And um, just to very, very, very briefly lay, lay out some of these um, tensions, the, uh, when we talk about black land struggle, the 40 acres and the mule, a lot of native scholars in the United States especially uh, have a huge problem with that in that they want to ask black movements, well, whose land did you rec are you recognizing that that 40 acres is land that is colonized? Yet on the other hand, many indigenous scholars and movement people kind of have this framework about we were here first and so everyone else is a settler and so they call black people settlers, they call uh, indigenous peoples from south of the U.S. border and north of the U.S. border settlers as well. So accepting these colonial borders. I was really happy to hear Sarah talk about how when she started to to really uh, study indigenous struggles in the United States and beyond, it made her really question the idea of starting politics with the nation states. And, and I think that that is really powerful too and see in, in, in what I see, though, in the movement work that I do and the intellectual work that I engage is that still many indigenous movements are still focused on the nation state, are actually focused on the nation state. It's mostly in the United States and maybe Canada. I don't know the Canadian context very well, but I, I do contrast that with the Mexican context where many indigenous movements there are not talking about sovereignty, they talk about autonomy. 
which is a project that is not about nation state sovereignty, but it's about the ability to live, create, and, and, and continue ma maintaining other worlds. And so in talking about that, um, and, and, and the, on this uh, MLK weekend, I think what's something that is on my mind quite a bit is how is, you know, this question of capture, how is it that our radicality of our existence in other worlds, in our resistance for other worlds gets captured into the dominant world? And I think about that a lot with the book I'm writing on Palestine, very, very briefly, the argument, it's called Palestine and the Wretched of Empire. The Wretched of, of Empire are Israelis. They were the wretched of the earth and decided in order to survive, they would become of empire. So rather than being the wretched from below, they become the wretched from above and use that wretched status to colonize other peoples. That's not exclusive at all to Israelis. Palestinians do this as well. Many Pal Palestinian leadership wishes that they could be the handmaiden of empire in the Middle East instead of Israelis. Many of our movements here in the United States with Barack Obama, like this wish that we could have a black president. Now we had a black president being the head of empire. In uh, Bolivia, Evo Morales, just the, the focus of having an indigenous person or someone who looks like us be in positions of power seemed to be enough. Uh, and that is my argument, capture. And I think a lot about that when I speak to my, my friends in the radical Christian community who have taught me about how Jesus himself has been captured, was captured by empire. Uh, and so many people are very allergic, many radical leftists are allergic to talking even about Christianity, about Jesus, because they believe that to be the empire's religion and don't know about the everyday life of Jesus and, and his followers and what they were trying to do. And so when I think about King, there is so much radicality within a lot of what he was saying and what he was doing, especially toward the end of his life that we don't hear about the way that many of us are taught about King is um, mostly about nonviolent, non nonviolence, be pacifist, integrate in, uh, into, in, into the US project. And we don't hear about others, such as of course, like the, the famous contraposition of, of MLK is Malcolm X, who did, did not want to integrate. So the, the, the things that did that really distinguish those two figures is the question of assimilation, not the question of violence and nonviolence, because MLK's movement did employ violence. They had, they had armed bodyguards in order to be able to do that work. Um, and there's a lot of the stuff that's written. It's just stuff that we're not taught. When I also think about MLK, I think about Ella Baker who is someone that we don't learn about, but without Ella Baker, there would, there would be no MLK. Ella Baker was very central and gifted in creating organizations and making them thrive, like SNCC, for example, like the, even the SCLC it, itself. I would even argue with MLK to, you know, a, about his top-down approach and would talk about how we need, to, we need movements that are leaderless and leaderful at the same time because strong people do not need strong leaders. And we see that uh, this co-option of the movement that she was a part of, that so many people were a part of into just one figure seems to replicate this idea that only one person from above can make struggle in, and it invisibilizes so much of where power does reside, does get exercised. And if we are trying to get out of this cycle, of what it is that we should um, maybe consider focusing on. Um, so that that to share is that we have so much that we really need to look at in a critical way. And a lot of that can be painful. And it's not just people of color, indigenous or black people, it's also Europeans and how Europeans themselves were destroyed in order to become white. It, uh, they had to be homogenized. So much of the difference that existed in Europe uh, in the modern world needed to be destroyed in order to become white, in order to become settlers. Uh, this is assimilation that took place among Europeans as well. And something that's um, 
very painful too is not just looking at the oppressor and romanticizing us as revolutionary subjects simply because we've been oppressed recognizing the real truth is that people who have been violated oppressed almost led to the point of extermination the vast majority of what i see in the movement work that i do is people simply trying to survive but not really going as deep as how theo did uh you know, you know survive as how uh, what kind of people do we want to survive as or do are we just okay with having a pulse with being alive and so then a lot of what that what what has happened in, in very, very painful ways to all of us is that if we're simply trying to survive, if we're trying to assimilate into this world, this dominant world, there are rules to follow in that dominant world. And there are rules that are and logics that are about competition, about individualism. And so then that leads us to not want to move as collective in collective anymore and just worry about ourselves and maybe our nuclear family, which is the, the, the one collective that the modern colonial world will allow. And so really, need, you know, the need for us to be really critical about how colonialism, genocide, enslavement, capitalism, patriarchy, how it injures us as groups, but also how many of us adopt those logics and simply trying to survive and so then we hurt each other as well. And so, so much work of healing is necessary, so much critical thinking, so much really painful self-reflection, but has the possibility of being quite liberatory. I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Kiki. <clears throat> Kiki is uh, one of our uh, <clears throat> Lumpen Professoriate folk here uh, <laughs> as a popular teacher of um, yes. political theory um, in the Abundant Table uh, circle. And we, we so appreciate um, your sword, your knife. Yes. So thank you. And thanks for being with us. Um, your good friend Vivian is with us. And uh, Vivian, it's so appropriate to have a Palestinian uh, with the last uh, leg of reflection. Mm -hmm. Thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you. Um, I don't know if it's, a, uh, well, I'm glad you think it's appropriate. <laughs> um, thank you. And thank you for including me in this special circle. Um, hold on. The view has changed. I'd rather see people than myself. Okay, great. Um, well, it's so much to digest in, uh, in this short time together. Um, so much in terms of all the different threads and the struggles that it seems that each person who is logged on here, even if they haven't said a word, uh, is clearly logged on here because we're all struggling, uh, as Kiki so clearly put it, in a world where I guess we're all looking for some strong leader in a way uh, because we're not feeling strong enough uh, individually and thus collectively if I don't know if that's I don't want to reword your words in, in a different way but actually Kiki and I have been discussing this very topic in the last few days and I think about it a lot and about what is missing like what is missing in our what is missing in our struggle, I guess, because it often feels extremely lonely, even if, you know, we have each other sometimes to vent with and to talk, uh, it still feels extremely lonely. And it makes me think of uh, how lonely maybe Jesus also felt, uh, or how lonely, uh, I don't know, MLK felt. Uh, and, and why should we be so lonely? And I think about this loneliness, um, a great deal, uh, not because, uh, not, not because I just want to, of course, alleviate my own feeling of frustration and loneliness in the movement, but also because it makes me wonder, like, what makes the dominant world so dominant? 
that mm -hmm. most folks really uh, will sit with you and they will tell you that they agree with you. They agree with you wholeheartedly. But then when it comes to action, there are so many fears, so many fears that make people afraid to dream and not to be so uh, cheesy to bring the, the whole dream part. Uh, but that is actually what, what, what I feel uh, is, is really power, which is to dream. And in my work, uh, I've been also reflecting about why is it that um, I got to work in uh, seed conservation? Like wh why, are, why is seed conservation even like attractive to me as someone who, um, you know, I thought of myself when I was a younger, I'm gonna become, I don't know, like a, a, a lawyer maybe or something totally in the dominant world. And all of a sudden I am a, I'm, I'm following seeds and soil and I get too excited about worms than I do about people. Uh, <laughs> anyway, and I really got to think that um, the story of, of, of Jesus, uh, and actually Elaine asked me yesterday why I think Easter is a very special holiday. I'm from Bethlehem and I uh, don't like Christmas as much as I just, I really love Easter. And I love Easter. I, I got to thinking about it myself, uh, partly because of the myth, the story, the magic that, uh, that Jesus brings us in the story, you know, like something dead. I mean, he was dead. He was tortured. He was, I liked also what Reverend Darren was saying, you know, how do you kind of uh, transform this pain into something that is actually beautiful? And I think in, in the world, this loneliness is stemming from the lack of, of imagination, you know, our inability to imagine something that we don't see. We're so committed to reality that the idea of, of really believing in something not yet seen scares, scares us so much. And so when you try to present a vision that uh, you know, suggest that somebody died and was buried, and then he rose from the dead. Uh, you know, people will think you're crazy. And so, I like. I think there's a lot of power in being crazy, if you will, like in in being able to imagine things that we don't yet see. And I think these stories are really important. And so when I think of story, of course, I think of uh, all the seeds. Why did I fall in love with all these seed varieties of my ancestors? You know, why did I go back to look for, what did they eat? Why do I care about the story of um, the sweet or that pumpkin, you know? And, and the reason I care about these stories is, is because for so long, we have been told as indigenous people that we don't even exist. I mean, it's not that we're unwanted, we don't exist. I've had people literally look at me um, here in the United States. Uh, and when they ask me, where are you from? I say, I'm from Palestine. And they say, oh, well, Palestinians don't exist. And it's kind of a different kind of, uh, of uh, dismissal, like, you know, I can dismiss you as you're beneath me, but then I can also say you don't even exist. You're that invisible to me. Uh, you're that nothing. You're like you're so nothing. And so, from my from my end, I saw seeds as a very powerful tool to change this because story is so powerful. Like we are taught that we are shit. We don't exist. Uh, we don't, we're not worth anything, uh, uh, just like black folk, just like uh, indigenous folk in North America, you know, just like many peoples. If you, if, if one of us dies, we, we don't even get a name, you know, just a black guy was shot, a Palestinian guy was shot, you know, obviously uh, we all are familiar with the story, but I really, not intentionally, but I think maybe it was some kind of divine intervention that I started to want to create a new story. 
uh, you know, okay, the story is I don't exist. The story is what my ancestors did uh, was worthless. If only we could become like our oppressor. Oh my God, look at the Israelis. They're so amazing. They built these buildings. They brought McDonald's. I mean, you know, we have to look up to these people and uh, to kind of dismantle that story because story can be both used as a tool for oppression, but as we all know, also as a tool for liberation. So what is the story we are telling ourselves today? And what is the story we want to tell our children? What's the story we want to work towards? And I found a lot of power in these seed stories. Um, and, and one story I always like to share is the story of uh, a wheat that um, I fell madly in love with. Uh, and that's, uh, and this wheat actually, I was walking in the field uh, as I was working with some farmers in uh, the south of Bethlehem. And I saw this, you know, it was a field of, of wheat and one, one chef was, had these black uh, whiskers, if you will. And I looked at it and I asked the farmers, what is this? Uh, and he's like, oh, this is uh, Abu Samra, you know, nobody wants to, you know, don't forget about it. And I was like, no, wait, I mean, I want to know what is this? And then uh, we started talking about the sweet and uh, he was telling me how, you know, some people call it chahla, which means uh, the person with beautiful eyeliner, dark eyes. And uh, he, the sweet, had these dark, beautiful hairs basically and then we went and sat in a circle and we started to talk more about uh, Abu Samra uh, and people literally referred to it as this love and especially elders would refer to it as oh this 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 guy as if who lived with us but now he's gone and so I I, I started to think about like why if we love, like clearly there was such a big love. So if we loved him so much, why is he not part of our lives? Why is he not part of our bodies? Why do we not eat Abu Samra, who we say we're so in love with? Um, and I started to work with farmers to bring it back to the field and to grow it again. And I wanted us to literally knead it back into our bodies and to, to, to make it truly... Uh, you know, the bread of life, you know, which is to tell a new story about this black haired wheat that we dismiss for the sake of uh, uh, new modified wheat and to bring back, you know, our also our love of ourselves and to kind of shift the story from thinking we had nothing to offer the world to understanding that not only is this dark and handsome, beautiful, uh, it actually is uh, uh, drought resistant. It grows with zero irrigation. It, it fights all diseases. I mean, it tastes, as many people say, it tastes like cake, the bread, you know, people love it. And indeed, uh, last year we made bread with Abu Samra. Uh, and by the way, Abu Samra means in Arabic, literally the dark and handsome. Uh, and so... Um, I don't know if I can share this, but maybe I can send it in a link to the group. And so I collaborated with a young artist, a musician, and uh, we created a song about Abu Samra. It's a love song, but, uh, and the idea was that young folks who have been taught also all their lives that, you know, for them to be acceptable, for them to be worthy of life or existence they had to work in a bank and wear a suit and tie and abandon abu samra abandon their wheat uh suddenly you know now we have a kind of a pop song uh which was released actually three four months ago uh and it's a love song for our wheat and now you know farmers who have told me that they want to uh, you know, not grow this wheat anymore. And now they're calling me asking for more seeds for the sweet. And that's because mm -hmm. through the music, through the song, through telling a new story, through daring to imagine a new reality where being dark is handsome, uh, being who we are is beautiful, 
young people are calling and asking. They want to taste their history. They want to taste this bread. Um, and so I guess for me in this, uh, I guess, the gathering here, what I can share is um, this loneliness I feel that we all feel uh, can be combated, if you will, by our willingness to, to be more daring in our imagination, to say, you know, I'm willing to die a purist in my mind than to live a, a person who submits to stories that demean me. And I, and I, and I think that uh, for me, this is, this is what I love so much about the story of the wheat. And I should also mention that, you know, Palestine is a center of diversity for wheat and barley. So actually wheat itself was developed in Palestine and all the Fertile Crescent area. Uh, and so when we think of the story of Jesus again, who also came from there, uh, it, it also makes us think of the metaphor that is so almost literal that uh, when I started to think about the fact that my ancestors developed wheat, which was a wild grass that they had to, someone had to also dare to imagine that a wild grass would one day become a wheat that then we make bread. And uh, the English and uh, the Italians and all Europeans who eat pasta and bread actually owe it to the genius of our ancestors. And to think that we actually gave bread to the world and in a lot of ways we gave Jesus to the world. Uh, it makes, it, it started to shift in me the idea that perhaps I am not so worthless and perhaps I deserve life and perhaps we exist in ways that we didn't even imagine. We don't exist maybe in the dominant world but we literally exist in everybody's body because everybody eats wheat, everybody drinks, well, not everybody, but most everybody drinks beer, barley. And, uh, and yeah, and uh, that makes me feel like the work, at least at my end, where I feel also a lot of uh, companionship is, uh, when I meet people like many of us sitting here today, even on Zoom, who dare to imagine and who dare, despite all odds, to imagine a different reality and to have the courage to, if you will, walk towards something, even if it means sometimes that we literally risk our lives. Because, again, also through bread and through seeds and through the story of... Uh, of Easter or, or Jesus uh, coming, you know, back. Uh, we understand, and if you ever gardened, you understand that death is truly an illusion uh, because we are eternal in these stories and in, in what we can offer the world. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Vivian. Oh, dear friends, thank you. Thank you so much. We are so very grateful to all four of our panelists, to Theo Blue for offering us prophetic words and for sharing just a glimpse of your journeys deeper into racial and social justice. So thank you uh, for spending this afternoon with us. As activists and animators from communities of color at home and abroad, you are exploring many intersections in the work of decolonization. So we look so very forward uh, to continuing this conversation um, at next month's BKI. And speaking of which, I want to introduce our intrepid BCM board chair and longtime collaborator, Shadi Hakeem. Shadi has been fighting the good fight for racial equity at Ventura-based outdoors company, Patagonia. And he is here to talk about our new book and the upcoming Institute. And so to quote Vivian, 
speaking of dark and handsome, <laughs> welcome, Shaddy. <laughs> oh boy, you didn't tell me you were throwing that in there. <laughs> uh, wow, what a rich program, uh, especially for me as an, an Egyptian American and a settler of color. Um, and I'm just uh, still reflecting back on Sarah's connection to the stripped indigeneity of. Um, the slave ancestors of black Americans. I, I just found that such a powerful intersection. In fact, it sent me kind of down a, a rabbit hole looking at what um, my Coptic Orthodox heritage um, and how, how, whether there was complicity there with the slave trade. And I found some leads there in the Ottoman slave trade. So just kind of reflecting on all of these pieces. And as Elaine mentioned, this is also um, the second pre-institute um, webinar uh, uh, for the upcoming next month, uh, BKI. We're re really excited to be welcoming um, very powerful voices of intersectional faith and justice to continue the conversation, such as the friends pictured here, um, Dr. Starsky Wilson of the Children's Defense Fund, uh, Cherokee activist lawyer, Alison McCrary, Choctaw Episcopal, Episcopal Bishop, Stephen Charleston, Reconciliation Director, Reverend Sue Park Herr, and sociology professor, Dr. Um, Himalese Valiente Neighbors. We'll also have the kind of music and dance and poetry and Bible study and worship that we've all grown accustomed to partying to at the BKIs and a special memoir um, for our institute namesakes, Gloria and Ross Kinsler. So it'll be definitely experimental in these crazy times uh, with different kinds of community mixers and um, lightning talk updates from the circle and small group hangouts. Uh, since this will be the first time this is ever done virtually. But please register as soon as possible on the BCM website and talk to Chris White, um, uh, who I really look forward to hearing a little bit more uh, of his dry humor. And if you haven't, that's a real gift during these times. So we'll see how that comes over Zoom. And um, here's Reverend Art Cribs, um, the BK veteran and booster, uh, inviting you to join us um, in, this, in this video clip. I want to send greetings to my BKI sisters and brothers, comrades in the struggle for justice, equity, and new opportunities spread more broadly. Thank you, Chad, Elaine, Chris, and all of the BKI sisters and brothers who make this institute such a significant and enriching part of our lives. We are scattered, but yet through the gift of technology, we are gathered. I hope that these will be days of encouragement, enlightenment, enjoyment. A time such as this requires all of us working together, working faithfully, fully committed. And so congratulations, BKI, for continuing, even in the midst of a pandemic that would separate us, isolate us, and keep us apart, you forge on. It is my great joy to give you greetings and wish you Godspeed. So uh, we've come to the time for a benediction. But before we do, um, Chris is reminding us that we've extended this discount code for Elaine's new book. And it's uh, in, in the chat. Uh, you know, books are pricey, so we're doing our best to get uh, discounts out and about. So take advantage of that. Sign up for the uh, Institute if you haven't done that already. I want to give a special thanks to Tim and Chris. Chris did amazing work splicing together three different videos for uh, Jonathan and Sarah's talk. Uh, and we just really appreciate these brothers for helping uh, work the magic. Um, so I mean, we want you all to put yourself on gallery view and just twinkle at all the great people who have um, resourced us. And uh, thank you all for attending. We appreciate it so much. And we want to close as we opened with a musical offering that honors Dr. King and the ongoing freedom movement. Many of you know the work of Philadelphia-based jazz musician Warren Cooper. 
Uh, you can learn more about him and support his music at uh, these URLs here on the slide. Uh, Warren and I, we, our very first collaboration was at the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C., way back in April. At the time I was offering a public of the Second Gulf War through a gospel lens in this very formidable space, one of the many venues I've been invited to once. And Warren was responding to my reflections musically. Uh, in the clip um, we want to share, he offers a beautiful haunting rendition of Dr. King's favorite hymn, Precious Lord. And I remember feeling chills as Warren's majestic voice completely filled up that huge space with both pathos and hope. So we offer this reprise here with gratitude to Warren, who I think is on the call actually tonight, and as a benediction for our program this evening, we look forward to seeing you all next month at the Bartimaeus Kinsler Institute. Thanks to our resource people. Thank you all for joining us. So let the last word be his. He said at the heart of that famous Beyond Vietnam speech, it is for the poor of America I speak. It is for the victims of war I speak. It is as a child of God I speak. It is as a citizen of this country that I say the great initiative for this war is ours. The initiative to end it must also be ours. <laughs>